history of aviation, there are stars and there are superstars. The 777 is definitely a superstar. 777 has been a phenomenally successful airplane. It's a best-selling airplane uh, in its class. It's really a triumph of what happens when great engineering and great design come together. Through an iterative process, working with engineers and designers and production people to come up with a solution that meets a whole broad set of requirements. There are many things that an airline needs to be successful. They need a fabulous product that really balances all of their technical requirements like fuel efficiency, low emissions, with the really important interior aspects. They want a product that's really appealing to the flying public. Because it has the widest cabin interior, it allows the 777 to seat more passengers than any other aircraft in its class. And that allows airlines to customize the interior to create Hi, so good afternoon to everyone who's joined thus far. Uh, we are currently awaiting the, the rest of the, the participants to, to jump on. So uh, we have a, a video here running in the background in the meantime. So we're looking to start at about the, the quarter to the hour mark. So just kick back and enjoy this video in the meantime. and different which is more friendly for the environment the ability of the triple seven to generate revenue doesn't just end with the cabin story the airplane can carry over 200 cubic meters of cargo so the airline can bring all the passenger bags and goods on the airplane and an unrivaled quantity of revenue cargo. So you've got more passenger revenue capability, more cargo revenue, and you've got more point-to-point -point routes. Simply put, the 777 looks much more to airlines and the passengers. Over 35 million flight hours. That's an incredible statistic. And that shows that the 777 is really proven for the long haul. We work with the latest tools and techniques and go through detailed iterations between the design requirements, the aesthetic requirements, the engineering requirements, the production requirements to come up with the best all-around solution. Our latest model, the 777-300ER, has an amazing 99.5% on-time reliability. That means it takes off on time practically every time. The reason we focus so much on getting the design right and the build right to ensure that our customers, the airline, and their customers have the most incredible experience every time they step on the triple seven. Wednesday in Farnborough, and Boeing continues to make strides with another big step forward with Carter Airways. Part of the largest product launch in commercial jetliner history by dollar value. Cutter Airways finalized an order for 50 777-9X airplanes. It's a commitment for an additional 50 777-9X purchase rights and announced an intent to order four 777 freighters. This totals an order for 100 of the Boeing 777-X, which will become the backbone of Qatar Airways fleet and represents the largest aircraft order in the history for a single aircraft type. Stepping along with its larger siblings, 737 MAX celebrated a new customer as Hainan Airlines committed to purchase rights on 50 737 MAX 8 airplanes. And in 20 years, we are so and all the success things we have done were definitely part of it because the Boeing support. Another 737 order. This for two. passenger and cargo layouts. The airplanes will provide the carrier with increased flexibility. MG Aviation finalized an order for two additional 787-9 Dreamliners. The leasing company now has four 787-9s in its portfolio. At Farnborough, customers who have been attracted by the 787-9 value and efficiency are now being drawn in by an opportunity to see the newly certified airplane. 8,300 nautical miles. Good afternoon, everyone. Mm. 
this is Christopher, uh, one of the founders of the club. And I see a few names here that I'm not familiar with. So I'll go unmute you guys and you can introduce yourself, um, starting with Howard, if you don't mind. Howard, can you tell us something about yourself? Are you hearing me? Yes, I'm hearing you. Okay, uh, my name is Howard, as you, as you said just now. Um, I live in Canada, and I'm currently an AME, aircraft maintenance engineer. Uh, I wanted to fly at first, but then I got into maintenance, but in probably a year or so, I'll be flying again. So I'm glad I'm, I have the opportunity to be on here to share this moment with you guys, you know? So I'm just here to learn some more and and give all information. Thanks. Thank you. Um, could Craig, can Craig um, tell us something about himself? Craig Fisher. I'm to unmute. unmute. I'm unable to unmute Craig. Mm. Can someone unmute Craig? Uh, I don't think Craig is available. We should ask someone else. Okay, all right. Um, who's Delon747? Dalai, can you tell us something about yourself quickly? I'm not hearing Delon. Um, what about Miss Gill? I just want to say something. Everybody is free to unmute when your name is called. You don't have to be unmuted by the host. Who else we have? We have we have a very shy crowd today. Ms. Gail, would you like to say something? DLX pilot. Could we have an introduction from DLX pilot? Yeah, hi, how's it going? Can you guys hear, hear me? Yes. Okay, perfect. Uh, my name is uh, Damar. I'm a pilot uh, at Air Canada. I have uh, the uh, Airbus 319, 320, 321. Uh, got introduced to this group uh, through Instagram. And uh, prior to Air Canada, I flew the Q400 at West Sharon before. And before that, I uh, flew the DC 130J Hercules in the military. I uh, did about the military, and before that, uh, I was my undergrad at uh, the University of Western Ontario. Uh, got an invite uh, from one of the uh, group leaders uh, to join the meeting today. Um, I know we're not uh, flying. Uh, a lot of us aren't flying right now, but just wanted to be here to see what's going on with the group, and if I can help encourage uh, anyone in this group to continue to pursue their passion and their uh, dream to do something in aviation. Okay, um, Richard, would you mind taking over the meeting um, since it's your meeting and lead the way? All right, great. Uh, thanks, Chris. And uh, so, welcome again to to everyone who is uh, currently online. Uh, as Chris said, my name is Richard uh, Richard Gordon. Uh, I'm a club member with the the Aeronautical Club of the the West Indies. Uh, I realized that that a few of you guys were kind of shy just now. So if everyone is doing okay, I just want for you to put a thumbs up 
in in the chat. Hey Kim, what's up? <laughs> so, uh, I just want to get the, the, the meeting rolling. So, uh, just wanted to say welcome to, to all of the, the new. Uh, so, the thumbs ups are coming in now. Uh, Catherine gave a thumbs up. Zachary Smith, thumbs up from him. All right. So, just wanted to say welcome to, to all of the new and also the, the returning uh, members of the, the Aeronautical Club of the, the West Indies. Welcome to our, welcome to another installment of our club meetings. Uh, we, we normally meet at the, the Tinspen Aerodrome, but as you all know, we're, we're currently going through a, a global crisis with the, the COVID-19 pandemic. So uh, we've now been we've been forced to, to move our meetings online, which to think of it, it's not really a, a bad thing. It's it's kind of a good thing because we, we're able to have uh, persons join, joining us from all over the world. So just just want to say thank you guys again for, for being a part of this meeting. Uh, I want to say welcome to, to all of the aviation professionals who are, who are here as well. Uh, I want to thank you guys for continuing to show show your support and to always uh, for always continuing to to come to our meetings and to to help us to achieve what what our main goal is, which is to to bridge the gap between the, the aviation enthusiasts and also uh, the the professionals. So professionals are, are where where they want to be in aviation or are at a great spot in in the aviation industry right now. So this platform gives them a chance to reach back to the, to the enthusiast who is just coming into the, the aviation industry and uh, who would like to move, move further in their aviation career and be where, where you are right now. So thanks again for, for all your support with that. So I uh, wanted to start off by giving a few updates first first updates in, in aviation in general. And uh, after that, then I'll just go ahead and give some, some club updates. So in aviation, uh, we, we've had quite an, quite an eventful past couple of weeks. Uh, most notably, a few things with the, the unfortunate incident with the, the, the Pakistan uh, airline that, that uh, unfortunately had an accident. Uh, Outside of that, uh, the, the the Boeing, the Boeing seven thirty seven Max, uh, we we got news that that is going to start. They're going to start producing those again soon. So that that's great news for Boeing in that space. And then lastly, with the the general aviation updates, we we had the the exciting moment where I don't know if any of you guys were actually following over the past couple of days where the the the, the shuttle launch the, the spacex rocket the dragon uh they're able to complete their their first flight in in nine years so that was the the first flight from from the u.s soil carrying actual human beings into to, to lower orbit which i've been following it for the for the past couple of days uh I don't know if any of you guys are, are interested in in rockets and in, in space travel and all of that, but that that field also falls under aviation. Right. Uh, I see I see Delian747 saying that he, he was uh following following that. So was was very interesting to to see that and uh I, I watched it up to today where where they, they finally docked at the, the space station and they had like a, a nice the ceremony with the, the the astronauts boarding the the International Space Station and it was it was a, a great deal. It was a, a major a major step in the in the process where the 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 ultimate goal is for, for human beings to go to the moon, which is the next step, and uh, actually work on the moon for 
extended periods of time, ex extended periods of time. But we also see where the, the, the final and most important goal is to launch from the moon and venture off into unknown territory, which is Mars. So definitely some exciting stuff happening in the, in the space of aviation. So moving on from that, we have uh, club updates where I am pleased to announce that the, the engine for our Cessna 152, our, our club airplane is now back on the island. It, it, it has been, been out for a number of weeks and uh, we finally were able to, to get it back to the island. Now, before, before we get the engine installed, we were working on uh, a major facelift for the, for the airplane as well. So I want you guys to, to keep glued to our Instagram feed because we have some, some exciting stuff to, to unveil to you guys in the, the, the next uh, couple of weeks. So once the engine is installed, once we do our facelift to our aircraft, then uh, as, as we've been, been saying to our club members, the, the airplane will be uh, available for, for club members to use. So uh, that, that's the update on our, on our aircraft and the engine and what we're doing to the aircraft. Now, lastly, for, for club updates, what, what I want to say is that we are, we're considering moving back to to physical club meetings in the in the near future uh it's it's quite a, a touchy topic with, with all that's going on right now i know that we, we aren't we aren't in the clear where, where this covid19 pandemic is concerned so we are in the midst of deliberation as to how we're going to to facilitate physical club meetings the protocols that we will follow and we just want to continue to to do our part in uh flattening the curve and eventually knocking the curve out of existence. So uh, we know that we have to we have to keep considering COVID-19 at this time, but we also want to, in, in keeping with the, the flow of what we're doing or what the nation is doing, we want to uh, get back into what we, what we consider to be the new normal with, with our club and with physical meetings. So that would be it for from me for the updates. Uh, I want to open the floor to to questions where the where the updates are concerned, because the last time we spoke on, especially for the the club updates, I I, I realized that a, a few persons had questions. So uh, if anybody has any questions, with the club updates, uh, the engine is back, the airplane is getting a facelift, and we we want to. Uh, well, we are looking into getting physical meetings up and going again. So if anybody has any questions there, then, then I'd open the floor to, to that now. Hi, Richard. Mm -hmm. Kimberly here. Thank you. Yeah, ju just a question on the physical meeting. So will you be considering maybe doing a hybrid, so physical and virtual for those persons who, um, one, may be a little uncomfortable going out during COVID time, or two, just, you know, aren't on the island. Um, I heard some persons from Canada and so on. So just to um, accommodate remote persons. All right. Uh, I, want to, I want to pass that, that question to Chris Gooding. Chris, you there? Yes, I'm here. <clears throat> we are considering a hybrid indeed because we realize the efficiency of Zoom as well as we are on Instagram, um, we are on YouTube and Facebook Live. So this to give people and um, persons who are interested from Portland, Montego Bay, St. Elizabeth and all across the island who will not be able to travel to the club physically and all the people outside of the country who are interested in what we're doing, an opportunity to still zoom in and be connected with us. And um, right now we are on YouTube for those who may not want to be interactive, but observe. And we're also on Facebook Live 
for those same reasons. So um, yeah, it's going to be a hybrid. Don't worry. Okay, awesome. Thank you. All right, guys. So uh, if there are no more questions, then I, I want to get to the, the meat of the matter. So today, today we have a presentation, uh, a PowerPoint presentation. Uh, first off, I want to start with, with what the, the point of these meetings are. I made mention of it earlier, but I just want to draw a highlight to that again, where the, the meetings are set up in a way where persons, persons who are maybe low-time aviators like myself, or persons who are enthusiasts uh, like a Hassana or a, a Antonia for now, who are looking to, to embark on their, their aviation careers at some point in the future, uh, this platform is, is basically geared towards having persons like them basically being in direct contact with, a, with an aviation professional. So like for, for Howard, for, his, for instance, uh, he's a He's an aircraft, a certified aircraft mechanic. I, I hope I'm getting that right, Howard. Uh, long story short, he's he's licensed to work on on airplanes and not just the small ones, big big passenger airliners. So also Gianni, who is who is a who's an airline pilot, and I, I, for, I forgot the name, but Delian uh, seven triple seven is it? Dalian, he he's a he's a airline pilot as well. Sherik Sherik is here. Sherik he, he's a controller over by Manly Tower, and we have a host of of other uh, aviation uh, professionals. Christopher Gooding is an aviation professional uh, as well. So, I think this is a is a great opportunity for for persons without experience to connect with persons that do have experience and are professionals in the industry, so that they can. Uh, basically bridge that gap between 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 them so today today is a special one for me so it's, it's a particularly uh, proud moment because uh the, the presentation that we are about to do is going to be done by one of our club members uh one one thing that I, I always prided myself on with in this club and and with this club is that uh, it's not a, a one-man show. We, we we give opportunities to persons who who definitely show the interest and who want to put their best foot forward. Nathan is one such example. So, uh, Nathan, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. All right, great, Nathan. So, I mean, I already said your name, but just for formalities, if you could uh, go ahead and introduce yourself, uh, tell us your age and also what what school you're from. All right, so my name is Nathan Bloomfield. I'm 18 years young, and I'm from the Bridgeport High School. That's in Portmore. All right, so Nathan Nathan is is a lower six form student at Bridgeport High School. As you said before, you, him calling me old, but uh, I'm going to give you a pass so that Nathan he right. said he's 18 years young. So uh, as you can see, young persons are stepping up. So Nathan has a, a presentation today, right? And what I do want to say is that uh, Aeronautical Club of the, the West Indies is not, is not an, an authorized uh, flight training institution. So what our meetings are is basically knowledge transfer and basically connections between persons. So the, if you do want to get official flight training, then we would love to advise you to go on down to your, your local flight school uh, in whatever area that you're situated in right now and uh, get going with a, with a certified flight instructor to uh, get your official uh, aviation training going. Uh, these topics that we discussed, they are, for, uh, they are for conversational purposes. So uh, getting back to you though, Nathan, uh, we just want to find out from you what your experience has been with the with the club thus far, and how how you've been able to to benefit uh, from from what we have going on. 
All right, so far I've benefited in almost every way. It's such a nice experience to have hands-on experience with pilots, but to have conversations with pilots and get some insider on the industry. So it's it's been a really good experience so far in the club. Right. Right, good. Um so we, we, we give opportunities for, for young enthusiasts like Nathan to come on down to, to Tinsipen and be exposed to uh, not only aviation professionals, but to uh, state-of-the-art equipment that uh, we, we, ha we happen to, to have access to. So uh, Nathan was, was able to, to benefit from, from that. Now we have Nathan here today. On our Zoom meeting, he is going to be the one leading the presentation, 18 years young. So this is definitely a, a proud moment for me. So uh, Nathan, yes. if you want to, to share your screen, uh, that would be good. And whenever you're ready to, to intro your presentation, you can go right ahead. All right. So... As I said before, my name is Nathan Bloomfield, and today I'll be presenting on runway and taxiway markings and signage. But firstly, a short recap of what we did last session. So, does anyone in the group or does anyone want to identify what type of engines, different engines these are? Just unmute or even. I here. see Javel Nicholson. Javel, uh, if you want to unmute your mic, you can go ahead and um, answer. Oh, yeah, that was a mistake. Well, I'm oh, yeah, I'm yeah. All right, all right, cool, no problem. All right. Uh, all right. Does it, does anyone else have a answer? All right, starting from top left, you have the V layout. Going across to the right, you have the flat layout. Below that is your radial engine, and next to that is your inline cylinder. Okay, good. All right. So. We get into what only a runway can be defined as a strip of hard land, water, sand, or snow, which facilitates a safe arrival or departure of an aircraft. All right, so when designing the runway, the engineers and designers should mainly consider four things length and width of the runway, the type of aircraft arriving and departing, the airport or airfield, wind patterns, and also the terrain. All right, so basically with each type of runway marking scheme, that's the type of ap approach that would be available at that airport. So as you see here on a visual, visual runway, so that's a visual approach, you'd execute, you'd execute this, vis this landing with a visual reference to the terrain. So you wouldn't have any um, ILS instruments, which is ILS stands for Instrument Landing System. You wouldn't have any of those instruments assisting you to guide the aircraft down to the runway safely. So you have a non-precision runway, which you would then have a non-precision approach, which is a type of approach which utilizes lateral guidance, but does not utilize vertical guidance. All right, so what that means is that it will guide you in a sense to where the, you guide it to the heading, basically put you on the heading that the runway is on, but it wouldn't basically put you on a glide slope to glide slope to glide you right down to the runway safe. Um, you have a precision runway, which you have a precision approach, which is an instrument approach which uses both lateral and vertical guidance instruments. Um, have you guys ever watched a video and see where pilots in the cockpit have low visibility and they, they use ILS instruments to guide them down to a certain height. The runway is there, you know, but they can't really see it. But the ILS instruments 
guide the aircraft down to that certain height until they can possibly see. If they can see, they continue with the landing, but if they can't, they have to circle again or divert to another airport. All right, Nathan. So um, I heard you made mention of a technical term just now, right? You, yes. you said ILS. Yes. Um, is Gianni on? Hey guys, I'm here. Great, Gianni. How are you? Good, good. How are you? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. All right. So Nathan made mention of a technical term just now that um, I, I want for you to, to explain for, for all of the, the persons that we, we would have on the chat that aren't exactly sure what that is. So he made mention of an ILS. Yeah, so basically an ILS um, stands for Instrument Landing System. Um, and all it basically is, is a, a station or a facility at, at the airport next to the runway. And it emits two signals, which uh, travel away from the runway, expanding as it goes, like a cone. Um, think of it like a funnel. And basically the aircraft coming in on an approach to the runway will basically enter that cone and follow the electronic signals uh, down to the ground. So as Nathan said, it provides a lateral guidance through the localizer signal and vertical guidance through the glide slope signal. All right, Gianni, thank you for that. Uh, Nathan. Yeah. All right, so uh, you can continue. I just wanted to, to bring in one of the professionals um, to, to explain that, that technical term that you made mention of. Okay. All right. So, next we have these are representations of what the visual runway, non precision runway, and precision runway look like. So, this is Tintapen, and this is Ian Fleming. This is an old picture, it's, it's paved out now, it's more paved. And we have some South Donald Sons at International Airport. Oh, okay. Yeah, no. So next we have the pre-thresholds. So you have firstly you have different types of pre-thresholds. You have the temporarily displaced and permanently displaced. So starting from the left, I'll identify what type of threshold it is and basically describe, it, describe to you what it is. All right, so this threshold, threshold on the left is fit for movement, by the way. Hold on. All right, so everyone is seeing this? Yes, yes. All right, so the pre-threshold is this area right here. So I, with, for this pre-threshold, it is fit for movement of an aircraft taking off. It's also available to aircraft landing in the opposite direction as a form of stopway, stopway runway extension. So basically this is saying that if you want to, if you're taking off, right, and there's only probably one taxi at that airport, you would basically have to come up the entire, entirety of the runway, come to the end here, and you're, you'd basically be all right to take off, but aircraft wouldn't, when they're coming in, they wouldn't be able to land, come in low and land in this area. It's not suited. So next we have on, by the way, this is a temporarily displaced. This one is a permanently displaced. And this, this displaced threshold, you can identify by arrows. So you can identify permanently displaced thresholds by these arrows. Um, this type of pre-threshold means it's fit, fit for aircraft taking off, but not available for aircraft landing. It's similar to this one before. So next to this, we have another temporarily displaced threshold, 
and this area is totally unfit for aircraft movement, hence the two X's, right? So lastly, you have a blast spot or over an area. This area can be used by aircraft landing from the opposite direction as a form of stopway. However, it is not suitable for aircraft taking off. I have a question. Yeah. Why would, like, say for the first picture, why would you need to displace the threshold of the runway? What would be a reason to do that? Yanni, would you want to answer that question? Um, yeah, so there's, there's a number of reasons. Um, one of the first ones I could think of, for example, is um, if there's construction being done at the end of the runway, for example, let's say there's some buildings being constructed, um, or maybe there is a, a mountain high ground uh, at the end of the runway, um, it would not be practical to have the full length of the runway because the blast, the jet blast from the aircraft engines could damage um, the the uh, the building site or the construction area. So if you could imagine there's some buildings at the end of the runway and an aircraft's taking off, um, it could in some circumstances, depending on the type of displaced threshold, you could use the full length. However, um, it's typically based on the performance calculations. You would always use the uh, you could use the displaced threshold for takeoff, um, but if it's a temporary one, I do not believe you can. I'd have to double check that, but um, that's uh, that's the first thing that comes to mind typically. Yeah, and while you're here, can I ask one more question about that last picture too? They said that that's an overrun pad. Is that the same as an EMAS? Is it the same as a what? EMAS. I saw something about that. Oh, um, so basically the, the EMAS is a type of technology where, um, so the overrun, the overrun area, um, basically what that is, is for example, um, it's typically used in an emergency. So let's say the aircraft's accelerating down the runway um, and you achieve a certain speed called V1 which is at or above V1, you have to continue the takeoff. Um, think of V1 as, for those of you that drive, imagine you're on a, on a two-lane road, so you swerve out of your lane to overtake a vehicle, but there's a truck coming towards you in the opposite lane. As you're accelerating to try overtake the car, V1 is, for an example, is the speed at which you realize you have to continue or you you come back you you you, you go back behind the car now um, either if you have to abandon a takeoff at that speed you should have enough it's calculated that you'd have enough runway to stop the aircraft safely on the runway um, in certain situations that will put you into the overrun area which means you'll still be on the paved surface. Um, however, it's not part of the runway you would normally use um, as part of your, uh, your calculations. Um, and the, um, the EMAS, I think uh, you mentioned, it's a relatively new technology. Um, basically what that is, is I'm not sure if you all have seen some, some years ago, there was a Southwest Airlines 737 which um, I believe it was on landing. They, they had an emergency. I think the runway was slippery and they skidded off the runway, off the runway end. What that basically is, is um, the concrete or the material they used to make the runway at the end or the overrun, it's very fragile so that the wheels sink into it. Um, think of it like shells. So the weight of the aircraft basically crushes into this uh, material and it brings the aircraft to a stop. That way it doesn't go through the fence 
and onto a road at the end of the runway, for example. Tristan, thank you. All right. All right, Gianni, thanks for that. All right, so thresholds. The runway thresholds are markings across the runway that denote the beginning and the end of the designated space for landing and takeoff under non-emergency conditions, as Gianni said. So they are also they also indicate to pilots who are unfamiliar with the, air, the runway the width of the runway. So this this can be calculated by the amount of stripes on the threshold. So when you have four stripes, the runway is basically 60 feet wide and six, 75 feet, eight, 100 feet, 12, 150 feet, and 15, 200 feet. Right, so designation markers. All runways numbered are numbered based on the compass bearing in which the runway is oriented. For example, if you stood down this runway, you'd be facing exactly 272 degrees northwest, giving you the name runway 27. If the heading is not, not exact, just like the example before, so the heading is 272 degrees, they would basically round, round the number off to the nearest tenth. So if I'm approaching the active runway at If I'm approaching the active runway at Donald Sanctuary with a heading of 072 degrees, the runway would actually be numbered 07. So as you can see here, um, we have, we have our runway heading 072, but it's named um, runway 07. And in some countries, such as the United States, they removed the, the leading zero, making it runway 07. At larger airports, you may have multiple runways which go the These are known as parallel runways. It would be confusing to pilots as to which runway they should take off or land on. Therefore, parallel runways are identified with the letters L for left, R for right, C for center. That's if there's a third runway. So as you can see here, runway 2A left and runway 2A right. center line. This is a long dash white line which runs, runs along the entire length of the runway. This aids pilots in identifying the center of the runway and also line, is lining up correctly. All right, so anybody has any questions so far? So the touchdown zone. These markings identify the basically the landing zone or the touchdown zone for excuse me, Nathan. Yes. Can you kindly speak up a little? Um it's difficult for some of us to hear you. All right. So these markings identify the touchdown zone for landing operations. This is usually the first point of contact between a landing aircraft and the runway. These markings consist of groups of one, two, and three rectangular bars symmetrically arranged, pierced about the runway center line. So these markings here. So beyond this point, it would be basically the optimal landing zone for the aircraft. So they are coded to provide distance, in, distance information in 500 feet increments. So what that means is basically you'd see these every 500 to 1,000 feet. So from the threshold here to here would be 500 feet and going along. The aiming point. So the aiming point markings serves as a visual aiming point for a landing aircraft. These two rectangular markings consist of a broad white stripe located on each side of the center line and approximately 1,000 feet from the landing threshold. So as 
journey, as I was saying earlier with the ILS instruments, I don't know who can see these, but these are some lights. They are called puppy lights. And they work, they basically coordinate with the instrument landing system to guide the aircraft to these, to the aiming point, basically. So. Um, runway distance remaining signs. So runway distance remaining signs have a black or a red background with a white numeral inscription and may be installed along one or both sides of the runway. The number on the sign indi indicates the distance in thousands of feet of the landing runway remaining. The last sign with the number, number one will be located at least 950 feet from the runway end. So as you can see here, this aircraft is probably landing or taking off and they have 500, 5,000 5, feet left of remaining in the runway. And this would basically mean you have 3,000 feet wherever it is. So high speed exit. Typically found at business airports, high speed or rapid exit taxiways allow aircraft to vacate the runway at higher speeds. Having this type of taxiway in place allows for an aircraft to leave the runway quicker than permitting another aircraft to land or take off. Okay, so any questions thus far? Indicate. So somebody in the chat asking what the what does it the two seven? Uh, this is kind of going back to the the diagram that you had mentioned, well that you had showed us before of the runway. Somebody was asking what the the number two seven on the runway means. Well, this is a designation marker. So this is the compass. The, what the runway is heading. The runway heading. Right, so pretty much it's it's a, a, a compass direction, and that is what the what the, the runway is is situated in, or that's the direction the runway is situated in. So, uh, what is a taxiway? A taxiway is a path for aircraft. At an airport connecting runways with aprons, hangars, terminals, and other facilities. They mostly have a hard surface such as asphalt or concrete, although at smaller general aviation airports sometimes use gravel or grass. So you have the center line, and this is a solid yellow line which marks which marks the center of the taxiway. And this is basically the line that pilots want to stay on while taxiing. And you have the taxiway edge lines. These lines define the edge of the taxiway and there are two types of those. You have the continuous and beyond this line is a paved surface other than full strength taxiway and it is not intended for use by aircraft. So in this case, you have a, a paved surface beyond, but normally you wouldn't have you wouldn't have a paved surface beyond it. This is an example of a larger air, airport. So this is just for, this is not in every case basically. And then we have dashed. And in some airports, you may see dashed edge lines these sometimes lead to a flight line or a tarmac. Therefore, pilots are allowed to pass over the taxiway edge. So, but this one up here, the first one continuous, wouldn't really want to go across because it would be pavement that is not suited for aircraft or grounds. And for this one, it's, it's really weird, like a flight line, like as you saw in the, as you saw in this one, it leads to a term or a flight line, as you see here. So we have the taxiway shoulder markings. 
clear, cleared graded area around the taxiway is at least 25 width, 25, at least a 25 width, 25 foot width. This area assists the pilot in making short turns. Beyond these shoulders may have the appearance of a full strength pavement, but they are not intended for use by an aircraft and may be unable to support the aircraft. So again, beyond these double lines, these double continuous lines, it's not really suitable for your aircraft. So it might look hard, but it's not really hard. You can't support the weight of the aircraft. So Wait, I have a question. Yes. Wait, why are there a line sticking out of the I see lines that are sticking out of the line on the edge. What are those? Those are the college delineate what type of mark it's basically a stairway zone. Okay, thank you. Right, so I have a taxiway holding point. Taxiway holding position marking consists of a single dash yellow line. Pilots are expected to hold short of this marking as instructed by an air traffic controller. If no marking is present, a pilot should stop the aircraft at a point which provides adequate clearance from other aircraft. So this you'll also find more in Abyssia Airport where you have multiple aircraft um, on the taxiway or the flight line. And some aircraft would need to hold, stay at a particular area until the, the traffic in a certain area has cleared up. So they would basically, for example, they would say, Six Yankee, Juliet Romeo, you are to hold at holding point Alpha Bravo one, for example. So you come in, when you, while coming up to this area, you see the sign and you basically stay at this area until further instructed. So moving on, we have the ILS hold point. So normally, a pilot is reliant on his ILS system. For hold on. All right. So normally a pilot is reliant on his ILS system for ILS approaches to improve visibility. The radio signals sent out by ILS ground equipment can be disturbed if an aircraft or ground vehicle is too close to the runway. Therefore, an ILS hole mark is positioned further from the runway to prevent aircraft or ground vehicles from interfering with ILS ground equipment or approaching planes. So these would, will be at, again, airports that have ILS guidance, ILS instruments. And when we have low visibility, you wouldn't want planes taxiing all the way up to the runway. So these are positioned a bit further from the runway so it doesn't interfere with approaching planes or so. All right, Nathan. So um, asked in the chat just now, not, not sure if you saw that where um, I was asking if everybody can hear clearly. Um, uh, one person saying no, <clears throat> and another person saying more or less they can hear. Um, hear what is going on so um maybe i'm not sure if, if something is wrong with your mic or um it's a sound problem from your end but um would you be able to do something to get your um your audio a bit louder so, so that everybody can hear clearly All right, so is anyone, is everyone hearing me a bit louder? There's someone in the hands, hand up. Can we, um, can we have that person ask the question? Run rate, can runways be used in both directions? Pardon? Can a runway, 
be used in both directions yes, or is it yes okay yeah so all the markings that are on one side would also be on the other side yes so hold on let me show you. can i can i comment on that or yes yes you can so the runways can be used in in both directions this is damar by the way um but at some airports, like in San Diego, you have the example where runway 27 is a displaced threshold. So it would have different markings than runway 09 on the other end. And to keep in mind, because the displaced threshold is due to the permanent buildings and structures and elevation that's in place, um, sometimes performance wise, you can't take off in both directions. So you have to be mindful of your weight and operational capability going into some airports because sometimes you are weight limited in, in some directions where there's high terrain on the other end. Okay, I see. Yeah, Thank thanks you. for that, Demar. I have a question. Sure, go ahead. Let's say if, let's say there is no like obstructions on either side of the runway. Why would I want to use one side of the runway more than another? All right, so as we all know, aircraft take off into the wind, so depending on the direction of the wind, that's the preferred runways, the different side that you want to take, sorry. So that, that's it. All right. All right. So now we have runway hole markings. These markings indicate where aircraft must stop in approaching a runway. That's if they don't have clearance. They consist of four yellow lines, two solid and two dashed, spaced six or 12 inches apart and extending across the width of the taxiway. Um, that's our only is a mistake, sorry for that. So if, if, I'm, if my aircraft is here, right? I would need clearance to, this is a runway, this is the entrance to a runway. So I would definitely need clearance to even go on the runway. Even though I don't see anybody on the approach or on the runway, I would definitely need clearance to go in this area. But if you're coming from this side, you'd, all, you'd already have clearance. So that's why I see the dash. You're basically, there's a go ahead so you can pass. So when you see the when you see the, the, the straight, the continuous line here, it's basically stop or wait for clearance, basically. All right, so next we have the enhanced center line. The enhanced center line the marking consists of a parallel line of yellow dashed and dash lines on either side of the normal taxiway center line. This marking indicates that you are approaching an active runway and you should proceed with caution. The taxiway center lines are enhanced for a maximum of 100 feet prior to a runway holding position marking. And these, you really find them in busy airports. Yeah. So any questions? Uh, hold on, Nathan. Recapping, recapping a bit, right? So, I wanted for the for the purpose of the room for, for those of, of of us here in the in the Zoom meeting that wouldn't know, um, you had made mention of the pilot needing to stay on the the taxiway center line. Um, I would want to bring Gianni in on this question. So. Just would want to know why why is it so important for the for the pilot to to keep on the center line both on the taxiway and also on the the runway. I see Amri with his hand up as well, so we can take your question after um, Gianni goes. Amri. Yeah, guys. So basically, um, you know, when you start up the aircraft, um, you would be following instructions to get to the runway, either from the runway to the gate or the, the parking area or, or vice versa if you're departing. And uh, the center line of the taxiway 
and the runway is just a, is just an industry standard. Um, similar to how when you're driving, you would stay in your lane. There is not a specific. Um, there is not a specific. Uh, you know, marking on the road because obviously you would be just uh, the, the line separates the lanes. But on the taxiway, you would stay on the yellow line, and this ensures that you will be uh, your your landing gear will not be going onto the grass, um, etc. Um, as Nathan pointed out earlier, if you are turning onto the runway, um, the the markings um, at the edge at the edge of the, uh, the, the paved area, they are not as strong as the main taxiway itself. So if you're in a heavy aircraft, what you could have is on the edge of the taxiway, the asphalt or the pavement material um, could be weaker. So it could be damaged below you. Um, so it's just advising you a caution, caution for those areas. And I think, uh, Amri, you had a question? Yes. Um, well, what do you do if you're taking off and there's a crosswind? Uh, you were saying that you have to take off into a headwind. But what if there's only one one way in one direction and you have mm -hmm. to take off and there's a crosswind? Or, or even a tailwind? So yeah, so that's a great question. 99.9% um, .9 of the time, air traffic control would designate the runway in use as the active runway. Um, so I know earlier we were talking about the runway numbering. The best way to describe it is if you have a compass, everyone knows what a compass is. If you stand up at the end of the runway, you know that the compass needle points to the North Pole or, or to magnetic north. Um, so we have the coordinates north, south, east, and west, and everything in between. Uh, whatever direction the runway is running, um, if you're standing up at the end of it, the direction of the runway, whether it is 0, 090 0 degrees or 263 six, degrees, etc., um, you would round the runway number to that. For example, if the heading of the runway is 262 two degrees, it will be runway 26 meaning on a map, uh, that's the direction or the, uh, the, 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 um, the direction the runway is, is going. So um, you, would you would always take off most of the time with a headwind. Um, typically, the tower would advise you if there is a tailwind component and um, you, could request, um, you could request to change sides. There's some coordination involved most of the time you'd have a headwind. If you have a crosswind, um, whether it's from your left or from your right, um, you know, whether it, it would be a matter of, um, for example, let's say you're taking off runway 09, which would be pointing directly east, and you have a wind coming directly from the north, which would be coming from your left side, or directly from the south, which would be from your right side, um, you would stay on the center line and you would just, um, you just make a correction to keep the aircraft going straight down the runway. Uh, it's up to you whether you would like to request a different, to take off from the opposite runway. But um, in a condition like that, you would always choose what's best for the performance of the aircraft and what's the most economical choice as well. And I hope that answers your question. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Jen. Jen, Morris. Hold on. Oh. All right. So next week. All right. So, um, seeing seeing here in the chat, seeing here in the chat, uh, a few persons um adding adding to staying on the the center line. So, in addition to the to the to the landing gear um maintaining clearance with the the, the outskirts of the the, the taxiway the, there is also the issue of wingspan clearance so for for those big airplanes for example the the airbus a380 or the the 
uh, Boeing 747. Those are those are the the two behemoths in the the, the aircraft industry. Uh, special consideration for clearance of the the wing because the wingspan is so uh, wide. Uh, staying on the center line, especially for those airplanes, uh, would guarantee clearance of the, the the wings on either side from from obstacles or from from hitting into other airplanes, etc. Uh, I also saw where De Leon 747 asked, uh, what's the, the maximum headwind crosswind uh, that an, on average that an aircraft can land in? So <clears throat> I don't want to take a, a shot at that question where I would say that the answer to that is it varies. Uh, there, are, there are different weight classes of, of airplanes as, as you'd know. So for example, uh, a Cessna 152, which is a which is an extremely light two seater airplane, uh, the maximum for for that would 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 greatly differ from let's say a, a, a Boeing 747, for example, which would would greatly be able to to accept more more wind or or more intensity of wind. So so the answer for that is it it varies with where that is concerned. All right, Nathan, um, back to you. All right, thanks. So next we have vehicle roadway markings. The vehicle roadway markings are used when yes. to define. Um, I would just like to quickly acknowledge that I see um, Spike's iPad. If I'm correct, that is Captain Jason Spike, the flight instructor. Yeah, yeah it is. OK, sorry, Spike. Nice to have you here. Yeah, sorry, I was um I was paying attention to something else, but yes, I'm here. Can everybody hear me? Yeah, okay. Yeah, definitely. yeah man, I'm here. I am here. I am here. Thank you very much for joining us. Any Not contributions problem. you can make as a flight instructor, we would happy for the youngsters to learn something from you. Definitely not a problem. Just call on me if you if you guys have any questions. All right, all right, great, great. Thanks everyone. So um Nathan, you're saying about uh, vehicle roadway markings. Yes, these are used when necessary to define a pathway for vehicle operations on or crossing areas that, that are also intended for aircraft. These markings consist of a white solid line to delineate each edge of the roadway and a dashed line to separate lanes within the edges of the roadway. So this is, you find it basically at every large airport such as JFK or Miami International. So these, I have a question. Yeah. When you say a roadway, it means I can like I can drive my car and do like a taxi service on that road and pick like like a, like a <laughs> illegal taxi service. I can run like a robot taxi on that road or do I need permission? That's why cannot do that. Oh, so I can't run a, uh, I can sell bag juice on that road though? So, so that, 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 road? <laughs> that, that roadway, <laughs> that roadway is for, for, for airport, uh, airport vehicles. Um, so where, where your, your, your robot taxi uh, aspirations are concerned, no, you wouldn't be able to do a taxi service on those roadways. Yeah, no. <laughs> All right, Nathan. All right, yeah, so. All right, next we have taxiway and runway signage. So airport guidance signs provide direction and information to taxi aircraft and airport vehicles. Small air, airports may have few signs, few or no signs, relying instead on airport diagrams and charts. So there are two classes of signage at airports with several types of each. So we have the operational guidance signs and the mandatory instruction signs. So on the left is the operational guidance sign and on the right is the mandatory instruction sign. So we're going to get more into this. So the operational guidance, oh, sorry, taxiway location signs. These have a black background with a yellow inscription. The inscription is a designation of the taxi and on which the aircraft is located. Yeah. 
these signs are installed along taxiways either by themselves or in conjunction with a direction sign or runway holding position signs. So here we can see an example. So this is the black background with the yellow inscription will basically tell you on what taxiway you are. So for example, this is saying that you're on taxiway Delta and for this taxiway, as you can see over here, that would be taxiway or hotel. And you identify that by the left. Okay, so, all right. Taxiway, taxiway direction signs have a yellow background and black characters, which identifies the designation or intersecting taxiways. Arrows indicate the direction of that of turn that would place the aircraft on the designated taxi. All right. So, and also the secondary operational guidance sign or marking are the whole sharp bars which you already went through. Hold on one minute, Nathan. Anne Maria had a question. I'm going to unmute him now so he can ask. All right. Um, how how do all of these signs work when there's very low visibility? Well, they have they have a light. They have a light behind. And what about the the lines on the actual pavement? Yeah, they're they're also lit. Okay. Yeah. So you have mandatory instruction signs, right? So mand mandatory instruction signs are white and red. Uh, before you continue, Nathan, um, just one quick point. Um, on I'm not too sure who asked that question just now regarding low visibility. But um, just to add to your point, there are some airports where ATC has um, has basically what they call low visibility operation, where they'll basically provide a vehicle to pretty much guide it to the airport, or they'll they'll give you like small clearances so that you can make um, progress on a hundred feet at a time, two hundred feet, or five hundred feet at a time. Um, so that's another point that I just wanted to to make um, as early as to low low visibility operations. Uh, no problem. Thanks. All right. Thank you. Right. These show entrances to runways or critical areas. Vehicles and aircraft are required to stop at these signs until the control tower has given clearance to proceed. So here you would see this at the extreme extreme of a taxiway when you're entering a, a runway or when you're at a whole chart, whole point marking at, on a taxiway, you basically see this and this, yeah, as I said, it shows that it designates the extreme, runway extremity and it shows that you're on, you're approaching runway 25. Um, all right, so the next one is basically if you're at the second, runways have multiple taxiways. So if you're basically at the middle of the runway and you want to basically cross or so, or so forth, you, you'd see this sign that basically tells you're crossing runway 25 or 07, depending on the, the direction, All right? For these, for the rest of the, these four, I'll leave for a, a little bit sorry. Two seven and zero nine would basically tell that the runway is there and also the, the direction that it is in. And for these four, I'll leave for a later instrument landing system video. Right? And then after that, you have a no entry sign, which indicates that that area is prohibited. And after that, we have approach or departure surface holding position. And this indicates to a pilot a runway holding position that has been established for the protection of uh, approach or departure surface OLS to a runway. And so, Captain Spike, could you further speak on this? Sorry, what was the question? You said? No, for the 25 approach, at the last sign at the bottom. Mm -hmm. Could you further explain to the what what it is? What does it mean? Um, it's basically just just a sign indicating where, like, pretty much for this one. In, um, for example, for this one here, it's just basically saying that 
you're entering the approach zone or the if you enter that zone you might be um interfering with like an airplane that would be on an approach for example so it's basically as i said it's just a sign indicating pretty much where you're approaching for the most part so for the one on top that says for example um two five it just says two five it's basically just saying that you're entering runway two five for the one that says um two five approaches is basically saying that you're entering a zone that you you might be um causing you might uh, end up causing interference to an airplane that is on the two five approach for example so it's just basically again sign is to indicate where you are and um where you're going can i can i ask a further question on that what's the difference between that and ils hold um usually ils hold is really for that for ils holding um mm -hmm. positioning and usually the one that says approach is usually not necessarily for ils but for a different type of um instrument so like a VOR or an basically, ADF? Basically, exactly, or, uh, basically. Uh, not an ADF, an NDV, because you, you can't, from my knowledge, you can't interfere with an RNAV approach because they're from the satellites, right? Uh, that, yeah, that's correct. RNAV is a totally different um, setup and system. And uh, an LPV approaches and things like that use WASP. Yeah, 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 those are all satellite-based. Yeah. All right. All right. All right, Spike, thanks for that. All right, so next yeah, we have no more examples. So before, well, this is basically saying you're on taxiway Delta and taxiway Bravo is going across. And for this one at the bottom, it's a surface painting taxiway location and designate, designate. So it's saying that Bravo, taxiway Bravo is straight ahead and you have Alpha to the right. Right. This is a, not a mandatory instruction sign. This is saying that you're on Tango, taxiway Tango, and you are you have basically runway 18 and 36 in front of you. Um, this one down here, as you can see again, it says Charlie is to the left. Alpha is, I don't know how to explain, it's to your right, and Charlie is to your right as well. Uh, Nathan, we have a question from Amri Hanson. You ready yeah. to take it? Um, um, you can answer this when you finish this slide. Um, but my question was, when I'm at the airport, I see this vehicle that attaches to the front wheel of the aircraft. Um, what exactly is the point of that? Um, ask that question again. I, when I'm at the airport, I see a vehicle that attaches to the front wheel of the aircraft and like tows it. But what exactly is the point that's, of that? That's the right. tow. Right. Uh, um, could I take that one, um, Nathan? Yeah, sure. All right. So that that's called a, a tug. So it's an airplane tug, right? Or some persons would, would call it a, a, a tow. Now, the reason, the reason why you need um, a tug or a tow is because airplanes, the wheels of the airplanes aren't powered. So, you know, for example, in your car, uh, the front wheels, um, the, the engine gives power to the front wheels and then that spins the wheels and that's how you achieve forward movement. Now, in aircraft, the, the wheels actually don't produce any power. So, the... <clears throat> the forward movement of the aircraft would, would come from the aircraft's uh, propulsion system, that, that being the, the prop for the aircraft, for aircraft that, ha that have props or uh, from, the, from the jet engine for, for the aircraft that have uh, jet engines. Now, the thing is, uh, the, the aircraft, I want to say it doesn't have a, a reverse gear. So the, the wheels of the aircraft uh, they don't they they don't possess the ability to move forward or backward so in order to to get the the aircraft to move backward especially off of the the, the parking stand uh one would need a, a tow a tow truck or a, or a tug to attach to the front wheel of the the airplane and basically push it back um off of the the parking stand uh our version of that at Tinsipin isn't really as 
high tech. We have a tow bar, but it's pretty much uh, something that, that that we use to achieve the the same same outcome. So for the for the lighter airplanes, you are able to push them by hand. Now to to steer them, you would have to attach what we call a tow bar, a tow bar to the the front wheel of the airplane, and then we, what we do is we just push and pull them as we see fit with, with our hands. That's for the smaller airplanes. But for those uh, large airplanes, uh, you definitely need uh, some more horsepower to, to move them around, which that's that's where the the, the tow or the, the tug would, would come in. So you don't need it when you're going forward, though? Only when you're reversing? <clears throat> in some cases, they're used when you're going forward. Like, for example, if you're, if you're going to... Uh, move an airplane to to get it fueled at like a, a fuel farm instead of instead of having to start the airplane up and um, taxi it to the fuel farm some operators would opt to use a, a a tug to to basically pull the airplane to the uh, to the fuel farm in 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 some instances pilots may not be available to um, come and do the refueling and stuff like that so that is a way that uh, you'd use it in a forward moving application. But for the most part, uh, when the aircraft is going forward, you wouldn't need a tug because the aircraft is able to move forward under its own power, but not so much. In some cases, you're able, you're able to move backwards under the aircraft's power, but that isn't really a common practice outside of uh, certain, certain situations. Okay, thank you. All right, I see the I see the, the chat uh, lighting up there. But Nathan, Nathan, you can continue. All right. All right. So I just joined me. All right. So here we have an example where. We we'll have a whole chart line, which you see. It's given an alpha one, and it's basically telling it alpha one is where you are. That's the name of the, the, the where you where you are. That's the location, and you have the designator, which is Bravo. Right? This is telling you that Bravo is here, right? And up, up here is where we have the ILS whole chart. So Jaffa's earlier you were earlier you were saying that. Repeat a question from earlier, please, Jeffers. I was asking what's the difference between an ILS hold and an approach hold thing. So, runway 27 approach sign. So this is what it would basically look like in the real world. So it's, it's a bit further, as I said before, from the normal hold, runway hold marking. Oh. Yes. Oh, and I see it's like away from where the signal from the localizer would be. Yeah, right. So under low visibility conditions, aircraft will hold here at this ILS hold mark until they're further instructed. Like if they get, they, they'll get straight cleared for takeoff from this hold mark. Right. All right. So I have an uncle who is an aircraft technician, Craig Brown. Um, he wants to add some stuff, add some information. So I'll give him the floor. So you have, you have the floor, Uncle. Oh, hello, everybody. Um, uh, well, I wanted to comment on the the the, the, the tow bar tow tractor, but I mean that has passed already. So just whenever I have a question I'll, or a comment to make, I'll then contribute at that time. Thank right. you. You can still make that comment. It would be appreciated. Oh, I was I was trying to sign in um, when um, the information was was passed about um, the the tow tractor. Um, the thing is, this with like for major airports, even at, even at normally, um, tow tractors normally use a, a tow bar associated with, with the tractor. But larger airport like JFK and probably Miami, like in the states. You have tow, tow, tow barless tractors. Um, 
Surprisingly, I heard the, the captain spoke about um, the A380. In, um, in JFK, they have tractors that can actually lift the nose gear wheel off the ground and push the aircraft from the, from the gate. And um, so saying that tow bar and tow tractors come in different weight class and size. And so you when, um, the, 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 um, the airline would not just go and buy any tractor, even, even though it seemed appropriate. Truck, tow tractors are designed per type of aircraft. You know, so that is something that I just wanted to add to um, the tow bar issue, the tow tractors and tow bar. Thank you. All right, Craig, thank you for that. Um, always, always good to have a, another aviation professional in the wings. So oh, yeah. um, we really appreciate your, your input um, yes, thank in whatever you. we have going on. Yes. All, All right. right. Uh, afternoon, everyone. I'd like to add something if that's okay. Sure. You can go ahead. All right. So, in reference to the chat, I'm seeing where persons are seeing that most airports have banned the use of reverse thrust um, to um, to push back the aircraft. Um, I don't think it's banned, or maybe it is, but um, there are multiple reasons why it isn't used. One of them being, even though expect FUD to really be on the um, the tarmac because that's one of the safety things that persons look out for. FUD and remove them as soon as they see them and all of that. Um, that's one of the reasons you would want while um, reversing the engine to up FUD in the um, in the engine. Another reason and, and also the smaller aircraft, for example at Manly, are allowed to, to use reverse thrust like the sub 340s and, and the turboprops are allowed to use reverse thrust to move back the aircraft. So it's it's not really banned per se. All right, Phoebe, yeah, thanks. <clears throat> Wait, what was the first reason that you had said? Um, FOD, 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 that's foreign object debris, sorry. And so what in the, the pickup, um, foreign object debris in the engine while using the reverse thrust. Okay, thank you. All right, right and we, ha we have Sherry um, adding that they, the, the U.S. military aircraft uh, use reverse thrust as well. So, um, Nathan, yeah. Nathan, if, if you want to continue. All right, so. Any more, any final questions? All right, I have a fun one. Um, I want to pose this question to the group. Uh, it's open to either enthusiast or professional. So what I want you to know is uh, what is the difference between a runway and a taxiway? Can I answer? Sure. I run. Never mind. <laughs> Can I, I was going to say something about movement areas, but I, I just realized no. It may, it may add, say it. it may add, say it. Hello? <laughs> no, we're hearing. Oh, so the question was the difference between the runway and the taxiway? Yeah. Yes, it was. So in essence, the runway is used for takeoff and landing, right? And uh, the taxi. Uh, the, the taxiway is uh, <laughs> but no taxiway is a runway. I mean, <laughs> the taxiway is used to guide the the pilot to the runway. So I don't know if you guys got that. So the runway is where the aircraft lands and take off, or the taxiway is what guides it. You know. Yeah, to and from the the, the one from, Yeah. So whether it's from the hangar to the gates. So the taxiway is used to guide the aircraft to anywhere under the airport, basically. Um, engine run-up spots, um, the gates, gates yeah. the hangars, you know, everything. Yes. But the runway is just strictly for takeoff. The runway is just strictly for takeoff and landings. I mean, I've done high power runs on runways before because that's where the spots are available sometimes in the night. But 
they, they, they depends on the airport. They will use um like a spot on the runway. Am I the only one not hearing? Hello, are you guys hearing? Yes, I'm hearing. Um, yeah, I can hear you. I can hear you. Okay. Because Brian saying it wasn't. Yeah, hearing. By, Byron, you might want to turn on your your audio because every everybody else is hearing. Well, you wouldn't be able to hear that. So let me listen now. I see the chat. <laughs> but yeah, yeah. So I know for Pearson, Pearson have a couple high power high power run up spots on the runways. It's usually like the beginning or the end of the runway. It's not usually in the middle. And they would usually use some taxiways as a runoff spot, but yeah. So I guess that's mostly the different the the um the the, the difference between them, meaning the difference between them. All right, cool, cool, thanks. Uh so I I noted that that Sherik uh, made a comment in the chat where he said all runways are taxiways, but no taxiway is no. a runway. Uh, so sure? what? A, a, the second question <laughs> I wanted to add um, on top of the first one that I asked is: Are you are you are you saying that you wouldn't be able to use a taxiway for landings any at all? Oh, nice. Mm. The discussion is open to anybody, by the way. You see, you see, Amri with a question as well. But can a, can a can a taxiway be used as a runway? That that is my question to the group. Um, the answer is the answer I, is yes. Can I ask something? Can I make a comment? But isn't the pavements like made out of different like um different material? Yes, it is. Okay. Is, Helicopters land on taxiways, don't they? At Tinson Pen, they do. I mean, I've seen, I've seen helicopters landed on uncontrolled aprons before. All right. Well, how about um, um fixed wing aircraft? Fixed wing. I should uh, have been uh, more specific with the question. So fixed wing aircraft. To be honest, I, to be honest, I've never seen it with my own eyes. You know. <laughs> Harrison, I think the, what's his name? Harrison Ford. I think he landed on a taxiway accident. Yeah, he did. And then he, and then the controller got mad at him, and then he got mad at the controller, and then he got a number to call, and then he did it again a while later or something like that. Listen, if the taxiway available for me to land with a small <laughs> plane and a big plane, <laughs> problem, <don't you? laughs> someone could write me up after. <laughs> <laughs> but really and truly, the taxiway is not designed for landing because the weight of the aircraft impact in the taxiway has a lot yeah. to do with the design. Yeah. Whereas the runway is certain, the, the runway is more um, reinforced and more um, robust to treat landing. And where yeah. it's wider and more clear of obstacle, where on a taxiway is narrow and have lights and people driving and all sorts of things happening. So really and truly, while you should not be landing on a taxiway under any circumstances, but an emergency, a lot of things have to be taken into consideration because you don't want to be landing a 747 on Manly taxiway. <laughs> yeah, that, that's that would crazy. Be ideal. <laughs> I mean, but, but if a 747 stuck in the middle of Manly going in with a 182, you could try a taxiway landing. But I don't think you want to try, the, try that with Sherry Kim. <laughs> but, but I could also I could also say, um, and this is Demar again, um, military application. I, I was in the military for a bit. Um, we had specific taxiways that we could land on, and we would advise the tower, um, and we would actually it would be a requirement to to practice landing on those taxiways. So we could do it in a military uh, application uh, to land on taxiways. So uh, I don't know if. If the, the group focuses on some of the things that are uh, done in the military, I know we can, you know, kind of bend the rules a little bit more. But there are specific taxiways designed for takeoffs and landings. Uh, they teach you how to land on roads for invasion. They, 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 they're just practicing. The <laughs> anyway, um, we have um, we have someone all the way from Colombia as MacBook Air. Maybe he could unmute his mic and say hello to the group.
Are you there? Maybe maybe our Colombian friend is shy. Um, and we see Katrin. Where's Katrin? There was a female here named Katrin. Could you say hello and tell us about yourself? Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. 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 Okay, I'm, I live in Jamaica and I'm a high school student in grade 12. And I would love to pursue a career in aviation. Which high school are you in? St. Andrew High, St. Andrew High School for Girls. I love to hear that, I love to hear that. What did you say? I she love hearing that because I was also from St. Andrew High. Oh, hi. <laughs> okay, well, me too. Yeah. <laughs> small, small world, small world. Um, I see. Nice to see here. fellow aviators. <laughs> All right, men, let's give the female a, a five minute for them to say hello to each other and, and get their female aviation, um, you know, camaraderie up. There is someone else. There is Carmen. Is that male or female? I don't know. I just see Carmen, K R M I N. I see Kim R. Carmen. Jaffe, could you unmute them? And let they say hi. Everybody can unmute by himself, by the way. Who exactly? Ladies, you can unmute yourself, you know, and say hi. Carmen, Kim R. Uh, Hello. Hello. All right, I guess they're shy. <laughs> uh, uh no okay I, I was having problems on meeting kim are here could you tell us about yourself quickly okay yeah no problem so i have zero um experience with aviation mm -hmm. to be quite honest uh but was just very interested and richard invited me to richard invited me to this uh meeting and um i'm here with my little brother he's quite interested in aviation so we're just listening in could I correct your statement? You now have one sure, hour go ahead. experience. You have you now have one hour experience in aviation. <laughs> yeah, that's true. So I, I can add that to my resume. Yeah. <laughs> you know taxiways. <laughs> yes, yes. Runways, runways and taxiways, right? Yeah. I still don't get why you can't drive to operate illegal tax um taxis on the taxiway. Yeah, fast. I don't understand why uptown youth will never catch a taxi in your life. One drive taxi on the runway. <laughs> I'm not, I'm, that's not oh my. <laughs> you can't I could make a, I could make a lot of money doing that. Like no Jafaz. Yeah, definitely would them. make a lot of money doing that. <laughs> Tell them to jump onto the emergency exit and get in the pro box because it takes too long to go through immigration. Just, just jump the fence and stop. Um, I just want to, I just want to, hello, mm -hmm. I just want to comment on, on, on that. Even though it's um, maybe a, a bit of a joke, um, all vehicles that operate on airport, especially large ones, you need um, special plates and authorization, just like you need registration to operate in Jamaica. Um, and some countries, oh, the, the same thing for airports here, yeah? um, because operating on the apron and the taxiways and the, the driveways here, so, um, you have to, the, the vehicle has to meet um, minimum um, inspection requirement to say that it can operate safely on the, on the airport. And so um, you find that some runway, some airports actually design um, roadways that 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 the the vehicle has to drive on, especially no one manly. They are very strict with that, irrespective of the air, airport being um, very clear with, with, with airplanes. You have to adhere and stick to the driving lanes. Um, the vehicle must operate on. So it's 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 a it's not <coughs> it's, it's a very serious issue, you know. Right, right, right. So um, yeah, we see, see a a great um learning moment coming coming from. The lighthearted stuff that was said just now. I see. I see Karim in the chat. Um, 
asking if he could make a comment. Sure, Karim, you can, can go ahead and unmute your mic and uh, make that comment. Okay, see, just to add. Sir Spike as well saying that the driver has to meet a, meet a, a specific requirement as well. The driver and the vehicle. And the vehicle, and the vehicle also. right, just to add to what you were saying. So Karim, Karim, you can go ahead. Uh, good evening, everyone. Just to add uh, my bit from Montego Bay, the MBJ airport. Yeah. Um, what are you saying? I can verify that it does take place in Mobe. Both vehicle and driver have to go to the training. Vehicle has to go to the inspection and the sticker. Just like you have your license to scan your car, it's placed on each vehicle. Yeah. Yeah. Is there also like a restriction like you have to have like beacon lights and high vis strips and all of that stuff. All of that. Yeah, yeah. I also have all that. All right, right, right. So from both from the air marshal vehicles to whatever vehicle is authorized to enter. For example, I work on um, GB, which is a refueling plant. So each one of the refueling vehicles have to have an authorized vehicle from whether GB or from JARS, which is Jamaica Aircraft Refueling Service. They have to have their lights, have to have their strips, and authorized plate as well. Right, right. Uh, there's speed, and there's a speed limit also, and it's very the speed limit is very important. They have to adjust mm -hmm. the speed limit for those vehicles. But the question was asked about taxiway. Taxiway, just as oh, um, if you notice, Nathan was highlighting that there are mandatory signs, and and you notice that the mandatory signs are in red and white, and you know red normally means danger stop, right? Those, the fact that they're in red mean don't even think about going there because there can be um, um, punitive penalties going there. Um, and, and so the, 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 the issue about taxiways, taxiways is also forbidden. There are cases where drive lanes cross taxiways. And so you're trained as a driver operating a, a vehicle on the ramp, crossing a taxiway, how to, how to communicate to the pilot especially at night when you have your light on. Also, you're trained to, to, to know what to do if, if it's very, very poor visibility um, when you have drive lanes crossing taxiways. Um, and these are, and, and, and you're, very, you're trained well, especially at larger airports, how to deal with these issues. You know? Most of these things we don't face at normal Manly or Moby, but other airports, a larger airports, you have to be very aware. It's not like that. Airport or JFK, you don't want to be driving on the road in low visibility, and an A380 just comes out of nowhere. Right, because because at JFK, JFK, if everybody know JFK. I don't know. Well, I don't know how many people know. The the JFK, the the terminal is in a loop basically, so you can drive drive lane goes around the airport, and then you have a taxiway outside of the outside of that that drive lane. So from the runway on the taxiway, and then onto the terminal, and the drive lanes drive lanes is between there. So you're always crossing taxiway, you're always. So the, 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 the signs um, that are there, there are always a stop signs along the way, right? Um, to, 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 to tell you, listen, stop and look before you move. But, um, and also in JFK, it is so serious that if you um, break the rule there, you're, you're issued what they call of um, BOR, right? And if you get three of those, don't even think about working at JFK anymore. That's it. And maybe you won't be able to work in the tri-state, which is um, JFK, um, New Jersey, and yeah. and Laguna, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah right. right. Because because it's the, the port control, those three airports. And once you have a, the, the, the breach, you're not allowed to work at, at all at any of those airports. So it's driving an airport is not something that is very, very serious. You know what I mean? Okay. Another taxi restriction would be um, well, not everybody is trained to operate on the taxiway. You get special training for that. But right, body or any vehicle that's going on the taxiway would require two-way communication with ATC um, at all times. Operate on taxiway and on the runway. And I think in Jamaica, you need a radio license to be able to communicate, right, Sherry? Well, Sherry, well. Can you can I comment? Can I comment on that? Yeah, go ahead. Well, you know, you know. Well, while I was in Jamaica, I know that um, for for you to operate a taxiway, you have to the same exam that you use to drive on really a tax on really a regular driving lane. You have to get additional um, authorization on your 
what do you call it, AVOP? They call it the AVOP there? Airport Vehicle Operation yes. Park, like that? Right. right, right, right. You have to get a additional authorization on that pass to go on the taxiway. So, okay. um, so, so you know that um, in at Noah Manley, the run up bay is at I think three zero. I'm not sure. Um, yeah. Uh, right. So, sometimes the mechanics there they do taxi airplanes on the on the run ups, and um, they they need to have that <laughs> on their on their pass before they can actually the airplane out there. Right. Um. Oh, just to just to cut just to cut for a second. Um. We just I'm just gonna I see where Sherry is now back on. So. Um, mm -hmm. That question that you posed, you posed, um, Fabian. I'm just gonna have Sherik um, close out with that. So, Sherik, um, Fabian's question was if uh, the, the the operators of the of the cars um, driving on the airport, taxi is and runways specifically taxi, but the roadways. Taxi, okay, so taxiways and and, and um, runways specifically, would they need? Um, radio licenses to, to operate a vehicle on those areas? The question is for, for Sherik. Yeah, right, for Sherik. Yeah, we're hearing you now, Sherik. All right, um, I'm, not, I'm not sure if it's specific. I mean, you need to have a specific APC license to speak on the radio, but at our airport, um, we actually speak on a discrete frequency, which airplanes don't speak on. So I don't think I can clarify. But I'm not sure if they need a license, but not everybody is equipped with a radio. But only the persons who are going on the taxiway and the runway, um, they have to have a radio. But I would have to clarify if they need a radio license. But as I said, it's not an ATC frequency that mm -hmm. they have. Okay. okay. I mean, I know that I, as the person mentioned JFK. At JFK, um, the vehicles do speak to the ground controller on the ATC frequency, but it's not like that here. There's a separate frequency for that. Okay. okay. Well, for, for um, you're in Jamaica, right, Sherika? Sherik. Yeah, Sherik. 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 Sorry, you're in um Jamaica. Yes. Oh, all right. No, why is that? Because um, in Jamaica, from what I know, right. To go on the mm -hmm. taxiway and um or the runway, the airport operation who respond for the, the taxiway and runway, they are the one who will escort you. you, you as I say some big, the vehicles, the, the airline um mechanic or whoever is going on the taxiway are request to go on there, don't necessarily have the equipment to communicate with tower, but they will provide the escort service for that happening. And so they will have they will have in their vehicles the the direct um contact to um to the ATC um, when they're doing the escort. Okay. Communication. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. yeah. To the, um, so the guy who phones me, yeah, was just speaking. Um, I never. I worked out there for almost a year, and the never one time we made a call to tower was escorted. You had to just drive within the lines and go. Um, but it taps away. Or, yeah, the taxiway that you use from the JDF or from the parking ramp or the wash bay, you want to call it, or Air Jamaica. Oh, ramp. oh, oh, yes, oh. Okay. You actually don't need it. You don't need fuck any. Shot, fuck shot, fuck shot. If you, yeah. if you went on you fuck shot talk. without permission, I'm trying then to get, that, that's not I'm trying to get someone here to unmute their mic. See if they could hear me, maybe they could unmute their mic. Um, Xavier, if you can unmute your mic um, from your end because it's not our end. Okay, um, hello. Xavier is from Colombia. He's residing in Jamaica right now and he just started his ground school training. Um, yes. Hello, everyone. Hello. Um, thank you first to Chris because he invited me to the meeting. As he said, I'm from Colombia. Uh, I, I live in Montego Bay from one year ago. I just started two months ago with the um, online course with them, also the ground school. And just want to say thank you to the Aeronautical Club because he are following all my steps with um, with this course. And I think that these meetings are so good for all of the people as me that want to start introducing in this process. So thank you for everything and thank you, Chris, for that. Okay. 
De nada. Great, 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 great. Thank you. Thank you so much for the for the Richard. kind words. Yes, Richard? I'm here. I'm, oh, yeah. I'm here. Um, sorry. I thank you to everyone for the explanation and also for this for this session. Also because in this moment I'm in this unit from the book. So for me it's so useful this this class. So thank you for that. Wait. Where you studying right. the training at Timas? And Kingston. I live at, in Kingston and I started in the ground in the ground school in, or in the ground school with Chris at Kingston. I have to go on some days, but I'm working. All right, that, that's um ground ground at, at Kingston for the for the person who is asking. But oh, okay. um just Rich, just Richard, want before to you go, before you change this the, um to go back to the other thing, I just clarified mm -hmm. with one of the um NMIA airport operations officers that you do not require a license to transmit on that frequency. It's just training. Just training. Mm -hmm. okay. Richard, right. um I have to go please take over the meeting. Um right we're about we're about to wrap now actually because we're we're um almost halfway past the hour. So um right just to just to close I want to uh First, give, give major commendation to, to Nathan who, who put together the presentation that was done today. Um, thank you very much, Nathan. Uh, you did an excellent job. Uh, I think so too. Right, just want to say again that the, the Aeronautical Club of the West Indies is, is not a, a certified uh, or a licensed flight training institution. So for those of you who want to go on and, and get actual flight or ground ground training then we would advise you to to go to your your local flight school and uh if there's a, a local flight instructor you'd be able to get official training uh from them so uh i just want to to thank thank everybody who who came who came on our meeting today uh, I see where we, we had a, a, a steady number of about uh, 27, 28. So uh, just thank you to everybody who, who came out today. Uh, I want to give a, a special thank you to uh, the, the aviation professionals, as usual, who always come on and, and give us major support where uh, we're, we're not able to, to, we're not able to give. So a person like myself conducting a meeting like this I, i'd love to, to call on like a demar or a gianni or, or a craig for instance who would be able to give me a professional's perspective on whatever questions that are being asked uh in this um interactive session so uh uh thank you again to, to the professionals for always um turning out and and giving support to our meetings um i just want to, to thank everybody who again came out and um right at this at this point we're we're still uh battling the 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 world pandemic which is COVID-19 so at this point I, I just want to to implore uh to everyone to just uh stay safe um continue to um adhere to the the rules set by by the government uh you know, you're six feet apart, wearing, wearing your mask in public, uh, sanitize, 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 you know. Uh, we just want for, for all of our, our club members and prospective club members to, to stay safe during this time until we're able to, to meet physically again, until we're able to go flying again. And yeah, just want to, to, to basically say that to everyone. So... Uh, that concludes our our session for today. Uh, thanks again to everyone, and we will see you again in two weeks. Okay. Hold on one minute, um, Richard. The survey. All right. So uh, we're we're gonna be sending out a, a survey. If you take a look at the chat right now, you you'll see where the surveys will be posted. So that's. So our Facebook, Twitter, uh, we're going to be doing one on Instagram as well. If we're able to get that out uh, via email, we'll do that also. So it's a, a quick survey, uh, just, just asking a, a few questions that we'd love to, to get answers from, from all of you. So uh, just be on the lookout for that as well.
Okay. All right, guys. So thanks and enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you. Same to you, sir. All right. Thank God, Buenos Aires. Oh, Buenos Aires. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good day. Good day. Yes.